All right. Thanks, John. And uh, it's great to be here. A lot of familiar faces and some unfamiliar ones as well. Thank you very much for having me. So um, I do have some disclosures uh, relevant to this. I do, we do work with uh, both Edwards and Abbott and Medtronic in terms of transcatheter valvular technology. Um, aortic stenosis, I think we all know by now. Uh, calcific uh, trileaflet aortic stenosis is what we're really talking about today. Um, the bicuspid variation is, is not really what we're approaching with transcatheter valve therapies. You can see here on the right a um, calcific trileaflet valve, um, nodular thickening in calcium, but sparing of the commissures, which makes this different from rheumatic disease, uh, which has long been treated by transcatheter means. We know what we're doing with aortic stenosis. With severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, is defined as a valve area of less than one, mean gradient greater than 40, or a peak velocity across the valve of greater than four meters per second. We do know that once the patients develop symptoms, outcomes are particularly poor. The slide was published in, um, well, the slide wasn't, but the uh, paper was published in 1968. And it still holds true today. It's just the ages have largely gotten a little bit older. We do also know that when we treat the valve, patients get better. So the treated patients have the same life expectancy as a population without severe aortic stenosis, while untreated patients have a dismal prognosis. This is the benchmark. This is what we have accomplished with surgery these days. This across the board, 2002 to 2010, 142,000 surgeries in the STS database, a 30-day mortality of about 3%, and stroke rates of about 1.5%. Now, in certain risk stratification systems, you know, we, we, we'll deal with whatever we can, and whatever outcomes we can supply a patient may be better than nothing, but this is the benchmark when we're talking about across the board application to entire populations. A number of patients, up to about a third of patients, are not ever treated. They come to diagnosis and they're denied surgery, and reasons for that are complex, but generally function around um, comorbid conditions such as age, low EF, heart failure to mission, or multiple comorbid states. We do have ways of defining risk. The STS has a great algorithm, um, logistic regression, where we're able to um, impute a number of variables and um, assess a patient's risk of morbidity, mortality, long length of stay, permanent stroke, prolonged ventilation, et cetera, et cetera. But we do miss a number of things with this. It's an imperfect system. It's a great system, but an imperfect one. And we have subjective um, ways of assessing risk in addition to those that are objective and well studied. So up to 2012, our treatment paradigm over the spectrum of risk for patients with aortic valve stenosis essentially was they all went to surgery unless they were too high risk, in which case they were not operated upon. And that was essentially a death sentence. On the right is the five-year outcomes of severe aortic stenosis. And you can see here I kept uh, pancreatic and um, biliary cancer out of this because I wanted to prove my point. But you can see here that severe and operable aortic stenosis has a dismal prognosis over five years. So in 1989, the technology was first developed. This is the um, Anderson valve, which was the prototype for the balloon expandable prostheses that we're currently seeing. Um, the first in PIG was in 1992, and this is the uh, original publication. And in 2002, first in MAN occurred. So Alain Cribier took a 57-year-old guy that no surgeon in France would touch, um, and they were able to implant, at that time, an equine pericardial valve um, via a transeptal anti approach. This is the patient. This is Dr. Cribier, and this is a couple glasses of uh, champagne in the hospital. I love the French, always have. Um, so what happened next? We studied it. So in the extreme risk populations, of course, the first group you study are those at extreme risk that have no surgical alternative. And this is the uh, this was the partner cohort B, um, balloon expandable valve versus medical therapy, and we see a 20% absolute reduction in mortality at one year. U.S. core valve, um, this is their extreme risk population. They didn't have a control arm because by now it was deemed unethical to offer no therapy to these patients. But you can see similar mortality at one year. And against a performance goal of 43%, um, it was statistically superior to no therapy. In elevated surgical risk, these are patients that do have a surgical alternative, although not a great one. We do see here in a non-inferiority design trial that it is likely as good as surgery at 12 months with regard to all-cause mortality. And then in U.S. core valve, there's a suggestion, I wouldn't say a very strong one, but a suggestion that it may be superior to surgery in a high-risk population. So we've gone from zero to guidelines. 2002 was the first in man, and in 2014, we actually have class one evidence-based guidelines per the ACCAHA STS for how we can manage 
aortic valve stenosis in high-risk patients who are deemed at elevated or prohibitive risk for surgery. Now, they have to have a 12-month life expectancy. That's a nice caveat, so we shouldn't just be putting these in every patient who comes across the threshold with severe aortic stenosis, but it is a class one guideline. So the fundamental concepts in applying this to today and tomorrow here is remember how we got to this point. We got to start with that, and I'll get to this in a second. We need to learn from our past. We need to recognize challenges, seize opportunities, adapt, and evolve. This is standard. It's not unique to transcatheter valve. This is standard for any approach to any kind of new technology in medicine and outside of medicine. So how we got here, we recognize there was an unmet need, no doubt about that. We have some innovation. We have some cojones. We find out it works. Valve gradients are similar to that of surgical valve replacement at five years. We do it together, surgery and cardiology together, and this is a, of paramount importance. This cannot be overstated. And then we studied it meticulously. When we do all of that, we get to the current time. And if we apply these concepts to the future, we're going to be able to get to the next levels as well. When we learn from the past, the two big things are patient selection and complications. So we start with the extreme risk population. We know that there's a 20% improvement, so an absolute 20% reduction in mortality at one year in transcatheter valve therapy for patients at prohibitive surgical risk compared to medical therapy alone. But we also have to recognize that the one-year mortality is still 30% in this population. So the device, the treatment, is only good if the patient lives. If they die, they would have died anyway. So we can stratify based on clinical risk. If we take low STSs and compare them to high STS risk, what we see here is that clinical risk can actually predict outcomes in TAVR as well. They do better than untreated patients, provided their risk is, so, is not overly prohibitive in that they'll die anyway at one year of all the other medical problems that make them high risk for surgery. We need to tailor this and we need to re recognize this when approached with these types of patients and the decision making that comes after after that. If we break it down, we can see the predictors of poor outcome. This is from U.S. Core Valve. Wheelchair bound frailty, these are things that predict poor outcome. It doesn't mean you don't treat the patient, because most of the studies will suggest they do better than untreated patients. They just don't do as well as patients that don't have these comorbid conditions. Some clinical risk issues and comorbidities, high STS, home oxygen, prior cabbage, these do predict poor outcomes. And then low gradient, low flow um, situations where the the EF may be low, the gradient across the valve may be low. These patients will do better than untreated, but they don't do as well as their normal flow, high gradient patient. When we look at intermediate risk, there are some other issues to consider here, and that is that surgeons outperform the STS at good centers. So as you come down in predicted risk, you can see here that the observed risk, which are what these actual numbers are showing, the observed risk is actually less than the expected risk of mortality. So this really is our performance bar when we're talking about how we approach these types of patients. Lower risk patients will do really well with surgery. They may not want it, but they'll do really well with it. With TAVR, it's interesting because <clears throat> as the predicted risk comes down, and this is across different study platforms, this is the extreme risk, the high risk, and now the intermediate to low risk patients, what you see is a decrease in the predicted STS score as, predict as expected as we move down in risk. But the TAVR mortality actually remains about the same. So the reasons these patients aren't doing well and the reasons that we have about a 2% flat mortality is likely related to the procedure itself and not necessarily as closely related to the patient's overall predicted risk. When we get to 2015, what we're seeing here now is the paradigm. So high-risk patients go to TAVR. Inoperable patients should probably have nothing done anyway, um, truly inoperable. And then low to intermediate, the standard is still surgical aortic valve replacement. What's the pie? About 10% of the population is uh, treated with TAVR currently. As we move into intermediate risk, once these uh, studies are, are um, published and approved, and the FDA approves, we'll probably see a larger piece of the pie go towards transcatheter therapies. We've already seen in a clinical creep of indications. And low risk is going to stay surgical for some time. Um, when we look at complications, 
that's the next step of this. How do we reduce this kind of stuff? So in the major, in the first papers, um, this was a meta-analysis by the Valve Academic Research Consortium. It's a way of um, making outcomes similar across different studies so that we can really compare apples to apples. Death is about 5%. Uh, it says major in all here. I'll submit to you that all death is major. Um, this was in hospital and this was 30 days. And bleeding vascular and neurologic complications. So about 20% bleeding complications. This was with first generation devices, 22 and 24 French. Vascular complications were about 11 to 18%. And then neurologic around 3 to 5%. But cerebral emboli are common. Some degree of embolization is present in about two thirds of patients if we look hard enough. If we do MRIs on all these patients, we will see some degree of cerebral emboli. Um, this was a problem more in the past, the uh, famed iliac on a stick. Um, we were, you know, at the, in the initial cohorts, we had to be incredibly careful about iliofemoral size because it was our only option. We didn't have apical and alternative access. And of course, at 22 and 24 French, every tenth of a millimeter really did come at a premium. This is one of our early cases, and um, I have not forgotten that one, that's for sure. Paravalvular insufficiency may be even more of an important issue as we move forward. The devices have come down in size, so transfemoral access is considerably easier now and more common. But paravalvular insufficiency may be one of the potential Achilles heels of this therapy, because as we move in the lower risk populations, the minimal, minimalization of paravalvular insufficiency is going to be uh, incredibly important over the long term. We do know that the higher degrees of paravalvular leak are associated with increased mortalities at six months, one year, and beyond. And efforts to minimize this will be very important moving forward. So recognizing the challenges with patient selection, we have to define risk as best we can. It's probably less about fetal these days, although it is still relevant, but it is more about ideal risk profiles. And recognizing surgical risk is not necessarily TAVR risk. In the, moving forward to those populations, we have to recognize that the performance bar continues to rise because the expectation that the patient lives and lives longer is going to be more present. So we have to expect that we're not looking necessarily at six month, one year outcomes anymore. Whereas in the beginning of this, a 17 week outcome with the first patient in Rouen, France was considered a tremendous success. We also have to reduce our complications. The premium will be on optimal revol results and then of course, um, attention to costs. So in reducing the complications, obviously um, evaluation and management and the exclusion of futility is important. The CT scan has truly become the, the most important thing that we do. Because as more devices are available and as iterations of these devices come through, nuances within the annulus and within the relationship of the valve itself to the coronary arteries, these are going to become important because different devices have different properties. When you look in the past, it was just a matter of slamming a valve in and hoping for the best. But now again, as risk comes down, expectations rise, the performance bar rises, these things do matter. Cerebral protection is another issue. It hasn't necessarily been proven yet, but there are some devices in study right now looking towards solving, potentially solving that problem and reducing the risk of um, embolization. And then device evolution. So delivery systems, valve performance, and then of course the three R's, recapture, reposition, and retrieve. If we can do that, then we actually have the ability to perfect our results. Once again, in the beginning, it was a matter of slamming a valve in the right area and hoping for the best. Now we actually can pay more attention to aortic insufficiency, the relationship with the coronary arteries and transvalvular gradients with the ability of taking the whole device out and putting another one in if we don't like what we see. So in terms of device evolution, this is what we started with. This was the Edwards balloon expandable platform, 23 millimeters, 26 millimeters via 22 and 24 French access. That's all we had. As we move into 2014, we we're down to 16, 18, and 20 French for 23, 26, and 29. And core valve had been approved, the self-expanding platform for Medtronic, where all sizes were through an 18 French system. As of 2015, and this is our current approved technologies, we're looking at 14 or 16 French for the balloon expandable devices, and all sizes, except for the 31 millimeter valve for, for a self-expanding platform, is through a 14 French system. We've come down dramatically, and as a result of that, we've seen some impact of our complications. These are the first generation devices, and this was uh, after approval. You're looking at about 5% 30-day mortality, a uh, little less with femoral than with non femoral. So as we move into smaller devices, what we see very quickly is the proportion of femoral cases jumps dramatically. When transapical and alternative access were approved, femoral kind of went away, almost to about 50-50 with alternative access. But as Sapien XT and Corvalve got approved in quarter two, 2013, 
uh, or sorry, quarter to 2014, what you see, smaller devices equals more transfemoral, which should translate into a decrease in mortality. And this is across the entire partner compendium of studies, looking at mortalities early on with first generation devices in extreme risk patients to third generation devices in more intermediate risk patients. So we have seen an impact of mortality, both by patient selection, the types of patients involved in these trials, as well as the devices that are present. There will be a further evolution, there's no doubt about that, with um, concentration placed on pacemaker rates, paravalvular insufficiency, stroke, coronary occlusion, annular rupture, and the ability, of course, to retrieve the device and perfect our outcomes. Just real quick on a couple different technologies. This is St. Jude's Portico. This is currently in study. Uh, looks strikingly like a core valve, and there's going to be some IP, um, IT, um, intellectual property issues with that, most likely. But what we're, what there's one difference is that the cage right in this region, right around where you expect the coronary arteries to be, is considerably bigger, which should allow better access to coronary for patients to not only have occlusion at the time of the procedure, but have subsequent myocardial infarctions. Um, the Lotus valve, this is Boston Scientific, so it's currently in, in there, these are all approved in the U.S., I, sh I mean outside the U.S., I should say, but in the U.S. Um, this is a device that is completely repositionable, retrievable, and removable, uh, retrievable. Um, so you have the ability of actually placing a functioning valve as you go, so less, pace make, less use of pacing while you work, which has less hemodynamic implications for the patient during the procedure, and then a fully locked device once it is um, deployed. And then the direct flow is another device that's completely repositionable, retrievable, and um, recapturable. And uh, I won't spend time on the uh, actual technology, but bovine pericardium and the ability to, um, to see it functioning before you actually finish with the deployment itself. So then when we talk about seizing opportunities, we look at studies in lower risk populations and we look at specific subsets of patients. So lower risk studies are currently ongoing. There was the Notion trial in Europe that was a non inferior already designed trial with an STS of less than three. Then there are, there's actually Washington Hospital Center has an IDE for a randomized trial ongoing currently for low risk patients. And then both Medtronic and Edwards have announced low risk trials that hopefully will be starting by the end of 2016. So we will be looking at low risk patients even as we're looking to see the data come in, um, which will soon be presented on the intermediate risk subsets. And then when we look at subsets of patients, uh, just recently the FDA expanded the labeling of, of transcatheter valve to include patients with end stage renal disease and low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. This was actually two areas that were particularly challenging, recognizing that the patients have severe disease, but the outcomes in these groups may not be as good, but we recognize that the cautions, as long as the patients are otherwise well selected, may be overdone, and the FDA actually agreed with that and took away the caution on the labeling. Transcatheter valve replacement for aortic insufficiency, it's out there. Is it ready? Probably not, but it can be done. Bicuspid valves, again, can be done, often done well, but there are some nuances with regard to the valve and the anatomy that need to be considered when approaching bicuspid aortic valve. And then as Dr. Wheatley just showed, um, the combined procedure for an 82-year-old in Germany with a, a ascending aortic dissection and aortic stenosis was treated with both. So looking forward to the rest of this, I, you know, innovation is inevitable. There's a desire for this. There's venture capital beyond it. Working together, the heart team is the most important part of this because we can do this and it can be done well. Having some drive to push forward, studying it meticulously, there's no question that this will be a standard of care in the years to come. Thank you.